So as said, I'm MJ Irwin. I'm the head of product at Forte. We build a set of developer tools to make it easy for game developers to integrate blockchain into new and existing games. Uh, just to get an idea of who's in attendance, who here is a game developer? Okay. Who here plays games? Sweet. Who knows what Fortnite is? All right. Uh, tonight, this afternoon, I'm going to talk generally what Forte uh, means when we say blockchain games, kind of the problems that have been sort of causing hesitation for traditional game developers to get into blockchain, what we view as the benefit for games for blockchain, how to think about applying this for existing games, and how it's going to impact uh, the future of gaming. A little bit about me. I got my start 10 years ago in the video game industry working at a small mobile gaming company. There, I kind of did design and production on a suite of games ranging from farming, city builders, first-person shooters, tower defense, fork strategy games, kind of the whole gamut. I've also uh, co-founded a company that builds a game, game server as a service for game developers, so sort of have the perfect background for helping solve development tools for games, you know, like at least on paper. So we're not the first to proclaim this, but games are going to be the Trojan horse that brings blockchain to the masses. But when I say games, I'm talking about traditional games. I mean, the games that you play, your friends play, your kids play, or your nieces and nephews play. Currently, when people think of blockchain games, they think of these games that are really made for the blockchain. That means they're governed by rules set on smart contracts and white papers. They're really geared towards people who already are kind of into crypto. Um, and ultimately, the people who are actually playing these games are really mostly concerned about kind of what they're going to get out of it. As one game designer who works on blockchain games so told me, the players really only care about the payout. And I think that's evidence in how a lot of blockchain games are marketed to consumers these days. If we look at, oh god, why? Haha. -ha. All right. Um, if we look at kind of how uh, the biggest game that currently exists in the blockchain space is CryptoKitties. At its peak, at least according to DAP Radar, the most users it had in a month was 200,000. If you look at Fortnite, they have 78 million monthly active players. That's over twice the size of Coinbase, which is arguably the largest and at least the easiest to use of the crypto exchanges. The chasm between CryptoKitties and Fortnite seems huge. So how do we bridge this? Well, at Forte, we view blockchain as a tool. It's not the means to the end. So we're looking at blockchain in the same way that game developers looked at how to adopt cloud computing or virtual reality in the ways that it's going to bring new experiences to game players and create new ways of designing and thinking about games. But why? This is the most asked question that I get from game developers. Possibly you're asking this right now. Why do I want to adopt blockchain? On the surface, as a game developer, you look at what it enables and you think, I can do most of this with a centralized service. Why would I go through the headaches of the user experience of blockchain? If you think about what it takes to play a blockchain game, you have to find a wallet, buy cryptocurrency, go through some sort of painful KYC flow, decode hash codes in your wallet to figure out what it is that you actually bought. On top of that, you have really slow transaction times. So right now, you know, we've gotten to the point where we are basically like playing Fortnite and Call of Duty on our phones. And for a game developer, 
the read and write to the blockchain is just way slower than any game is willing to bear. I think even at the height of CryptoKitties, we saw the volume of transactions that are coming from games slowing down blockchain networks. Uh, so fortunately, there are a bunch of projects out there that are trying to solve these hurdles for game developers. Among them are Forte, Dapper Labs, uh, Immutable, Engine, and a bunch of other folks. So we think that these problems that are user experience problems are gonna be resolved. What we really need to start thinking about is how do we actually build compelling games for players? So what is it innately about blockchain that you can take advantage of? Well, if you're familiar with blockchain, it's really providing sort of an immutable record of every transaction that's happened for a series of objects. This allows you to have digital ownership for players, verifiable uniqueness in history, and allows game developers to adopt gray markets. So what do we mean by digital ownership? If you play games today, you'll think, hey, games already sell me items. I already own a bunch of characters or costumes, weapons and armor. We believe at Forte that just the idea of actually being able to own these items will encourage people to stick around games longer, invest more time and energy into pursuing these weapons and items inside of games, and ultimately encourage them to spend more. And the difference between blockchain ownership and kind of ownership today is that everything you own today in games is really tied to whatever account or centralized service that the game developer controls. You can't trade it, you can't do it something as innocuous as gift stuff you've already earned to other players. And that's because technically, you're really just licensing those assets from the game creator. You don't have control over them, and you can't think about how can I recoup the time and energy I put into earning this thing from the game, and instead, uh, you know, are just kind of stuck when you stop playing with a bunch of time and energy that now has kind of gone to waste. Uh, there's a game uh, called Crypto Space Commander that recently ran a promotion with Star Trek uh, for someone to buy the only instance of the USS Enterprise inside of that game. That player bought that asset for $30,000. And while it's a little bit creepy on the speculation side, you can bet that they only spent that much money on this thing because they knew that they controlled it and they'd be able to give it to someone else or know that they were the only one in existence with this ship. Games are increasingly connected, and they're all about building community and kind of recording your accomplishments inside of the game's lore. If you're the first to defeat a raid boss or conquer some big challenge in the game, you're being recorded on Reddit or on YouTube. Those actions are forever chronicled. And with blockchain, those records, those accomplishments, can actually be written into the fabric of the items that you collect. Imagine you're playing a Game of Thrones game. Imagine you have some asset called like a digital sword. Maybe it's named Needle. And you're able to track through its history that this was the first sword that actually slayed the Night King. That'd be pretty cool, right? It'd be like owning a pair of Steph Curry's Finals Worn Shoes. Additionally, if you're a game developer and you happen to have access to IP, you can start bringing value to the game through these franchise-based connections. You can bet that if you had, a, again, a Game of Thrones game that allowed you to purchase dragons that were hatched by various people, that if you had a dragon that was first hatched by Amelia Clark or a dragon that was first hatched by Kit Harington, you'd be pretty stoked about those dragons and could probably sell them to other players at a higher value than what you acquired them for, than some equally or arguably even better dragon than, say, from some rando guy. Um, so I think that this is really just gonna bring a lot of ability for game developers to leverage their IP. The last kind of big benefit is the ability to integrate gray markets into your game. Uh, Right now, any kind of connected online game that has a high level of collectability 
there's ultimately some sort of secondary market that's sprung up around it. Kind of one of the most notorious examples is there's a game called Counter-Strike Global Offensive that in 2016 was discovered that over $5 billion worth of skins, these are just customizations on top of various guns that you can collect in the game, were used in, on betting sites as collateral for bets. The developer Valve isn't seeing any of this revenue. On top of that, you've got other games that require a lot of time uh, from players to actually gain um, stats inside those games. So say, World of Warcraft, maybe you're spending months getting a character to the max level. Players, one, can't trade that high max level account easily to anyone else. But you also have a huge secondary market of people willing to buy max level accounts from other players on eBay or other third party sites. You even have people willing to pay other people to play their game for them so they don't have to spend the time uh, like in game to earn that status. We even have a friend who shelled out a couple thousand dollars to buy a max level guild from someone. Then, uh, one of the developers that we're working with actually saw the advantage of bringing peer-to-peer -peer trading into their game. It's one of the most requested features that they had for their users, and quickly had to shut it down because there was so much fraud. They were having so many complaints from players who were sending uh, you know, cash out to I got loot 69 on eBay, never to hear back from them again. With blockchain, they're working with us to see it as a way to verify all these transactions and reduce risk for them and their player base to enable a trading economy inside of their game. So, just to kind of give a high level, we're gonna get into the game design portion of this a little bit. Uh, just get a high level into what blockchain really brings to the games is you as a game developer can basically create a game currency sort of similar to premium currencies you see inside of free-to-play games. You can also create game items that live on the blockchain, can be owned by their players, so they can be traded and gifted to others. They can have history attached to them, so they can chronicle lore and ownership. Um, and again, you can foster peer-to-peer -peer trading. So because we're working with existing games, the how you approach uh, integrating blockchain isn't as easy as I think what most people's assumption is, which is like, let's just make everything in the game tradable. You really have to think about what is the core of that game and how blockchain is either gonna help or hinder that game experience. If you think of a game like Pokemon, the core uh, like compulsion inside of that game is collecting all these pocket monsters. Gotta catch them all is sort of the nexus of that project. I think everyone thinks, okay, let's just make all the Pokemon collectible. Easy win, a lot of people are gonna be stoked about that, they're not gonna have to chase down that elusive Pikachu or whatever. The problem is that, that actually breaks the game. Kind of the whole reason you're playing it is to attract all these monsters. So what game developers need to look at is how do we add um, complementary game mechanics into these games that actually are gonna benefit from the ability to have peer-to-peer -peer trading? One of the games we're working with is a battle game, so somewhat similar to Pokemon. You're out there collecting heroes. Uh, players have a collection of heroes. You're trying to collect all of them, level them up, and then you wage war against other players. The basic loop is, hey, battle get a stronger hero. When we looked at how to apply blockchain to this game, allowing players to collect the heroes and trade them outright was gonna break all the game's tuning and we think undermine kind of what people uh, find appealing about this game. Fortunately with this game, what we found, figured out was, hey, these heroes all have vehicles that they ride into battle. Currently, they're fixed one-to-one -one hero to vehicle. What happens when we release exclusive vehicles attached to the blockchain that players can collect and trade? These vehicles add an element of customization that never existed before. 
they also allow players to have more diverse tactics than what's currently in the game. Additionally, this developer is saying, hey, these vehicles can only be collected through accomplishing uh, feats, challenging feats. So they're not just, hey, go out and buy something off the market. They're actually going to be exclusive and scarce inside of the gameplay system. Players can then go to a secondary market, buy these vehicles from players who have already acquired them for game coins, which they can earn by coming back into the game. So the developer is looking at this system as, hey, we can improve engagement, we can improve retention, and we think we'll have people playing this game just in generally more because they're able to collect these assets that they can trade for other players with other players and easily upgrade their vehicles for their heroes. Another game we're working with is a battle royale game. The core is sort of similar where you're battling in a map with, say, 100 other players. Uh, but a battle royale game, if you've played Fortnite or watched Hunger Games, um, it's really important that everyone's kind of on a level playing field. If you, you know, naturally say, hey, let's just put all the weapons on the blockchain and allow players to trade them, but that will completely destroy the balancing of that game, and again, really what makes it fun. But players who play this battle mechanic over and over again are grinding for getting cosmetics that allow you to show your stats with inside the game, customize, or even coordinate with your teams. So what we're doing is saying, hey, let's take those cosmetic items that people are already striving for inside of this game and put those on the blockchain and allow you to trade them. Similarly to the RPG game, they're also going to introduce effectively a loyalty system where you can earn game coins. These game coins eventually will be allow you to subscribe to the battle pass. And what they're doing is saying, hey, if you want to be able to trade all these assets that you've earned, you have to be a subscriber to the battle pass. And that's how they're going to basically build a community, drive more revenue, and drive more engagement inside of their game. Uh, here's a different example that's using the idea of having some sort of valued currency inside of your game to drive player behavior. Uh, if you've played any of these big MMO online worlds, you may know that the end game content often requires you to have a large party of players, say six of your friends, um, to play for two to six hours together on a weekend to get through some really challenging boss. You know, as we all get old uh, and have lives, it's harder to get those six people together and commit a weekend to playing some game. And what ends up happening is you have a huge group of players unable to access this end game content. Companies have tried to solve this by saying, hey, you with a fancy guild, don't you want to volunteer your time to help shepherd possibly some toxic player through this experience? And what you end up seeing is Reddit's full of looking for game threads because no one's able to figure out how to band up with a bunch of other players. What if you could use a game coin to effectively introduce Uber into a game? So I, as a guild, could look through a queue of available solo players who've offered up some bounty uh, to be shepherded through this experience. This bounty or ante ends up acting almost like a social contract that says, hey, if I'm an asshole, I'm going to forfeit those coins that I've given up to this guild uh, uh, to take me through this experience. And the guild saying, hey, I'm willing to do this because I'm getting rewarded in some capacity for my time. Another example is that's solving like a real problem inside of games is if you play any of these complex like forex strategy games, uh, guilds accrue a lot of value. It's not just the prestige that comes with, say, being at the top of the leaderboards or whatever. It's actually, as a guild levels up and matures, many of them are acquiring perks that the guilds and each of the guild members have actually invested time and or money into accruing. But currently, you know, you can just get kicked out of a guild for an arbitrary reason. Like maybe someone wants to let their friend in, maybe you didn't log in 
on Sunday uh, or whatnot, and you've lost all that value. What happens when you're able to effectively give players shares in the guild that they're a part of? That the percentage of shares that they have inside this guild actually dictates things like voting rights, leadership, loot distribution, can be used as a recruitment tool within the game ecosystem, or even when you're willing to or ready to leave a guild, you could have people have to buy in as if you're in a co-op. We think that this will actually be a huge improvement in terms of engagement and commitment that individual players have for, for guilds. Much simpler mechanic is right now, players volunteer a lot of their time just helping other players inside of games. They're active in global chat, they're writing FAQs, they may even be roaming around an open game world helping revive players that have fallen or helping you de defeat a boss. Currently all that time and energy is goes kind of unthanked or unacknowledged. What happens when you're able to say tip players inside of games? You as a player are able to say reward someone for their contribution to your experience. Uh, we think this will ultimately actually make gaming a friendlier place. So kind of tying this all together and how we look at what potentially the future of games will be is Someone creating an MMO experience very similar to what we're currently playing, where you, know, you have players who are fighting dungeons to earn crafting materials. Maybe they're farming or building up a base to get other materials that they need to be successful inside the game. They're crafting weapons. They're raiding dungeons to get specific loot. Um, and they're all interacting with some sort of marketplace. The shift here is that that marketplace potentially is controlled by a player. Maybe there's 10,000 different players, all with their little shifty coat guy, offering up wares to other people. Maybe you're someone who just likes battling, so you're just, I'm just going to grind this battle loop, and I'm willing to offer my services to take your character through this battle loop for you, to level up for you, and I'm actually getting compensated inside the game for that time. People can now specialize and we think we'll create more of a real world economy inside of these games where players are able to uh, chase after what it is that they want specifically, and if they don't want to uh, be a part of a system, they can find some way to trade or barter their way into whatever those items are that they need to be successful inside of the game. And long term, we actually think that this sort of design will change the way that developers approach making games. We think it's going to change so that people are now looking at how do we build a robust real-world economy inside of our games, and less how do we target specific users who are willing to pay individually thousands of dollars for an experience. What happens to games when a game developer is actually trying to shepherd in uh, some sort of giant real-world economy into, into being, are they now, instead of outright selling items to players, just trying to take a transaction fee from all the transactions that are happening inside of the game, so they're actually looking to increase the amount of transactions and player-to-player -player interaction uh, that's taking place. Maybe they decide that actually they're just going to take a flat tax from every player who has some sort of economic value inside this game. Um, and that's how they're making their revenue, again, opposed to, say, targeting a very specific slice uh, of the user base. And we think, in general, it's going to bring about better games that are aligning the interests of players and developers instead of having these be sort of one-way interactions that we see today. Uh, so that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, as I said, Forte's building a development platform uh, to help developers integrate blockchain. If you're interested in joining this journey with us, uh, we have a development fund, and I'd be happy to talk to you after this. <laughs>